Very good. Thank you very much. I'm hoping I might be able to make it without the microphone. And I guess I'm going to start by asking, can you hear me okay? Because if you can, I'm not going to use the microphone. And I don't hear any objections. Anybody here from the zoo? No? Well, I always enjoy coming here. It's a great uh, venue for us. I know we've had the, the State of the Prairie here for several years. I was talking to my mother on the phone last night. She's going to be 90 next month, and I mentioned to her that I was coming to the zoo uh, for a conference, and she said, oh, please be careful. They may lock you up and turn you into an exhibit. <laughs> <clears throat> so that caught me off guard. It's fun for your mom to catch you off guard every now and then after all those years. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Armand Bayou Nature Center today and uh, some of our efforts that have progressed through the years. Uh, if you don't know Armand Bayou Nature Center, uh, we are located just off the western shore of Galveston Bay. We manage about four square miles. You can see uh, the red lines of the boundaries of, of what it is that we manage. It encompasses the three historic ecosystems that were endemic to the upper, coast, uh, upper Texas coast, uh, estuarine areas of the bayou, coastal flatwoods forests, and what we're here to talk about today, which is coastal tall grass prairies. So this is one of the largest remaining pieces of wild land left in Harris County. We celebrated our 40th anniversary last year. Uh, we opened in 1974 with a two-fold mission statement uh, to preserve and enhance the habitats that are under our care and also to provide educational opportunities to, uh, for the public to experience and understand local ecosystems. So as we'll see through our talk today, that's a big part of uh, what our volunteer program entails, which is both habitat enhancement and hopefully offering some educational opportunities to those volunteers uh, as they participate with us. When we first opened at the Nature Center in the early 1970s, the efforts were uh, really gaining momentum around Harris County to preserve some large tracts of wild land. During that era, we thought that if we could take the property out of the development cycle, put a fence around it, Mother Nature would essentially do the rest. And it was that era that we uh, hoped that that would be the case, but as time progressed, we began to see the habitats that we'd worked so hard to protect and preserve begin to degrade due to lack of management, due to lack of restoration. And in the early 1990s, we began to seek funds and partners to try to help to restore those coastal prairies that are under our care. We manage about 750 acres of grasslands at the Nature Center, and it makes us one of the largest remnant parcels around the Galveston Bay area. As our thought processes progressed regarding restoration and the development of restoration ecology was also evolving, we had to acknowledge that restoration was a human act. It takes people to restore and manage an ecosystem. And people hopefully put their thoughts together and create an organized plan. The Nature Center has a well thought out natural resource management plan. It's available on our website. It details all the various activities that we undertake for all of those ecosystems that we manage. A restoration plan is a very valuable tool not only to help you know what it is you're trying to achieve as far as restoration goals, but the plan can also be used to help secure funding. Bringing a plan to a funder or a grantor is very useful. Uh, it lets those funders and grantors know that you're not acting independently, but you've got a well thought out scheme for what you're trying to achieve in the landscape in the future. And of course that funding ultimately is used to purchase the equipment that's necessary to manage at the landscape level. And when we're talking about hundreds of acres of land, you're really talking about a pretty significant effort both in people, funding, and equipment to put all those pieces together. So over time, this complete cycle of restoration has helped us better understand and better implement what our long-term restoration and management goals are at the Nature Center. Now, if you talk to employees of various natural resource agencies or people that work for wildlife rehabilitation and wildlife management areas, 
One of the things you rarely hear them say is that we've got too many employees. This is the entire stewardship team that manages those four square miles that are under our care. And as you can see, three people are not very many to manage that much habitat, especially when one of those people is primarily in charge of chasing squirrels and frisbees. And I'm not talking about Charlie the Labrador Retriever either. So, in order for us to do a good job on such a large parcel of land, it takes a larger dedicated team. And that's actually what we're here to talk about is how staff has managed to expand management over all of these various prairie management units that you see here through the help of a well thought out volunteer team which has evolved over many years at Armand Bayou Nature Center. That program began long ago with the formation of Stewardship Saturday. In the early 1990s, we began to recognize we needed help and we weren't going to get it from paid staff. And in order to do that, we began to think about what could we do to attract people to want to come to the Nature Center. Stewardship Saturday was formed in an effort to give a regular scheduled opportunity for people to show up and in this case to do just about any type of management that would need to take place on the refuge, whether it was prairie management, invasive woody species, tidal marsh restoration, trail maintenance, just about anything that might need to be done that was of a greater challenge for our two people than what we could do uh, just with us. So we scheduled the first and third Saturday of every month as Stewardship Saturday. And it was scheduled as come if you feel like it. It was a non-committal kind of activity. That turned out to be a real great attraction to volunteers because you would always know when the activity would be happening. You'd know when it would start, when it would end. And you could sign up to put your name on an email list that would notify you of what the activity was going to be. So you'd receive the email that said this Saturday we're going to be working doing tidal marsh restoration work. And there was no need to respond, there was no need to RSVP. You just showed up if you felt like it, and if you didn't, you stayed home. Well, it turned out that from the beginning, that regularly scheduled non-committal type of atmosphere was very attractive to people because it gave people a lot of freedom and flexibility to plug in if and when they felt like it. But as time progressed, we began to recognize prairies were of particular importance. Prairies are a people-dependent ecosystem. It turns out that unless people actively manage prairies, they're always degraded. They turn into shrublands, forest lands. Unless people actively implement those historic ecological influences that fire and grazing animals once provided, they're always degraded. So the second focus of our volunteer effort turned to what can we do to attract people into our prairies to also do prairie only volunteer days. And it turns out that we mimicked our stewardship Saturday effort with the formation of the Prairie Friday team in the early 2000s. See Diane Humes sitting out in the audience there. Diane is second from the right in this Prairie Friday image here. I don't know if I have any of the other original Prairie Friday team members in the audience today. but. A very slow beginning initially. We scheduled Prairie Friday every Friday. Again, it was a half day activity running roughly from 8.30 to uh, lunchtime or so. And we'd get on a volunteer email. If you wanted to be part of the Prairie Friday team, you'd put your name on the group email list and then you would know that we would be doing brush control, seed collection, uh, whatever the list of duties were for Prairie Friday. And as time went by, the level of interest also grew. And as a result, the amount of work that was delivered through our Prairie Friday team began to expand exponentially. Prairies need a tremendous amount of highly variable work in order for them to be healthy. And it's very difficult to do that with a small team, but as time has progressed, you can see that there is an increasing layering of all of those different strategies of management that have managed to expand because of our volunteer efforts. Increasingly for us, one of the primary functions that this Prairie Friday team has delivered is through managing our native plant nursery. 
Armand Bayou is very fortunate in that we have a, a greenhouse, a rather large greenhouse and a native plant nursery that Prairie Friday team is capable of producing a tremendous amount of prairie propagules. One of the things you see in this image is an abundance of one gallon pots in the background as we have this Prairie Friday team uh, potting up these larger whole plant propagules in the native plant nursery. And when I say large number, annually the Prairie Friday volunteer team typically produces about 15,000 of these one gallon pots of locally rare grasses and wildflowers. Grasses like switchgrass, gamma grass, big blue stem. Grasses that once were the dominant species at Armand Bayou, but due to those overgrazing practices for many decades before the Nature Center took management of the property, many of these historic dominant grasses have disappeared and now are being cultivated and put back into the prairie to try to replicate that historic assembly of plants that once occurred there. You might also notice the signage in this picture. Our native plant nursery and the Prairie Friday operations are right at our entrance. So as people come into the Nature Center and they walk through our Nature Center trails, one of the main things that they're initially exposed to is the concept of restoration, the concept of native plant nurseries and the work that we do to manage prairies. Well, growing the plants is only half of the project and the bigger labor component of the Prairie Friday effort is getting those plants back into the ground. Increasingly, our efforts have turned to a different group of volunteers through local high school and college students through a program we call the Service Learning Program. As the name implies, there is a service component. That's what you see in this image. The students come out from local high schools and colleges and they help us to install some of those 15,000 one-gallon plants into the prairie. In addition to that, when the service element is over, at the end of the morning, we go into the Nature Center Auditorium for a brown bag lecture where we get a prairie ecology lecture. And in that lecture, the students are given one of these prairie restoration and ecology booklets that they can take back to the classroom for their teachers to use for further reflection and further studies as part of the prairie ecology curriculum. Remember, our mission is to provide local ecosystem curriculum, and hopefully this is an effort that helps to put that in the hands of teachers where they can more better use it. So service learning is the way that we kind of complete that circle of growing plants and putting them back into the prairie. This native plant nursery operates a greenhouse. If we have bad weather days, we can use students to work in the greenhouse, uh, propagating these seedlings. Occasionally, we actually harvest and collect whole plant propagules. This is a group from Deer Park High School. I happened to be driving by Deer Park High School one day when I noticed a for sale sign in front of one of the most beautiful prairie pothole wetlands that I'd ever seen, filled with blooming spider lilies. So the entire ninth grade of Deer Park High School walked across the street, dug about 2,000 of these spider lilies up, and today are located along the entrance road of Arm and Bayou Nature Center. So another strategy to employ those service learning elements of high school and college age students. One of the beauties for me of the Prairie Friday effort is that the people that grow the plants are very invested in their well-being and those people that actually have spent the previous six months collecting the seeds, taking the grass cuttings and clippings, growing them in the native plant nurseries, then guide the students out into the field. This is one of our Prairie Friday volunteers, Jay, who is demonstrating to students how to install a plant properly. So he does a very good job of that, largely because it's probably taken him about six months to grow that plant that's in his hand there. The students also understand that. Another type of Prairie Restoration volunteer project that we uh, began in 2007 probably one of the earliest large-scale prairie restoration community-based events is Prairie Pandemonium. Prairie Pandemonium is the opportunity for volunteers in the community to come to the Nature Center. It's our biggest day of volunteer restoration. We take usually somewhere between 100 and 125 residents from the surrounding area 
and oftentimes plant three to four thousand of those one gallon containers in the field before lunchtime. That creates a tremendous amount of pandemonium, as you might imagine. It's a lot of activity in a short amount of time, but also a great morning both for restoration and for education because hopefully people in the community leave with a little deeper investment of actually having put part of their day into the prairie at the Nature Center. In a full year's time, we're creating change at the landscape level. So when you look at one year as a snapshot of what we've done, you can get a glimpse of a large scale area, about 15 acres. You can get a glimpse of how many plants have gone into the ground, about 11,000 11, plants. You can also get a snapshot of all the various schools, universities, and colleges that have participated from the local area. So very meaningful, both from the perspective of restoration, if you multiply this by the 10 years that we've been doing it, where sometimes we've planted as many as 15 to 20,000 one gallon containers, there is a tremendous bringing back of the natives of those historic plants that were originally in that assembly of plants of the prairie plant community. We also maintain a team that goes out to pull the weeds. We're really kind of gardening at the landscape level, aren't we? And what we're doing through the spot treatment team is controlling those invasive woody plants. Sometimes with chainsaws where we cut the trees down and apply an appropriate herbicide to the cut stump. Sometimes just by spraying on those smaller saplings that are growing up. But again, over time, this volunteer spot treatment team typically controls about 15 acres of prairie over a quarter. So it doesn't take a large number of people what it takes is a dedicated group of people to go out regularly to achieve those types of results. Our oldest volunteer team is our burn team. Nature Center began prescribed burning in 1979 and uh, one of the interesting aspects about the burn team is very similar to that of the Pasadena Fire Department. Pasadena Fire Department has the largest volunteer fire department in the United States. Armand Bayou Nature Center also has largely a volunteer team and Pasadena Fire Marshal who issues our burn permit requires that we have a minimum of eight volunteers on the fire line. You saw that we only had two paid employees so simply put without trained dedicated volunteers on the burn team we couldn't implement this critical element of prairie ecology. You can kind of see a, a trend increasing starting in the mid-1990s when we began to kill Chinese tallow trees in large-scale areas, creating new areas of prairie that needed management, meaning that we had to do a much uh, more in-depth job of recruiting volunteers to make sure that we could maintain that burn team. We currently have about 140 people that have been through our burn training class that enable us to conduct these burns. In a full season, January, February, during our burn season, we may conduct somewhere between five and 10 burns. That means unless every of the same person comes every time, we have to have a rotation of people that enable us to have that minimum of eight people that are required to conduct that prairie burn. It's one of the most dramatic spectacles of nature to see this, and uh, it is one of the, the most well attended volunteer uh, teams that we have is the prescribed burn team. We also have a team of people that runs our tractors, volunteers, get trained. We're very selective about who we put on one of those big bat wing mowers. Have a, a, a very interesting historical reflection in one year we opened up tractor training to the entire Prairie Friday team. One of the women who showed up to drive the tractor, her legs wouldn't reach the clutch pedals. So uh, it kind of was a, a sobering awakening for me to realize that we needed to be a little more selective of people who are operating heavy equipment. But it turns out that managing volunteers on tractors is a lot easier than managing rotating a herd of bison through the prairie. I miss Rob's talk this morning and I wished I would have heard that, but uh, uh, this type of management is a lot more predictable and easier to maintain over time 
and we do about two to three hundred acres of prescribed mowing in our prairies every year. Much of that is done through our volunteer mow team. We started collecting transect data with volunteers, I believe in 99, 2000, somewhere right in that range. Uh, we worked with Texas A&M uh, Rangeland Department to help us set up some of our initial transects. That vegetation transect uh, collection uh, philosophy has evolved over time, but every spring and fall, we have a volunteer team that goes out and collects data from these 32 transect lines, collecting data about these indicator species, trying to give us a better understanding of how our prairies are changing over time in response to these various management activities that we're undertaking. Gives us a better approach to understanding how maybe we need to shift and shape what we're doing. But a tremendous data set. When you think about spring and fall since 1999, that is uh, quite a lengthy set of data to, to give us a, a better view of what's happening in the prairies. Think about volunteer programs as how they can leverage staff time. Because when I look at a list of what we do on an annual basis at Armin Bayou Nature Center to create this vast habitat mosaic that you see behind us here, it simply couldn't be done with two people. What you can accomplish with a dedicated team of volunteers by consciously devoting time to developing volunteer teams will always leverage staff time far beyond what any two individuals are ever capable of delivering. And this habitat mosaic is of course what we would see back in time played out over the grand scale of the upper Texas coastal prairies. Some of those areas being big areas of wildfire where you can see this burn signature. Some of these areas of the green mode area mimicking those big areas of bison grazing. And of course some of that area being left untouched. Which is what enables a small patchwork of prairie like this, this mosaic to support such a great diversity of wildlife and bird life in a relatively small area of land. Well, in order for volunteers to feel like what they're doing is meaningful, it's important that we all come together. And we have twice yearly planning meetings where we bring the entire tribes together of all of these various volunteer teams that I descri I'm describing to you. And we look ahead, we plan ahead, and we collaborate. You have to keep in mind that a lot of people that are part of your volunteer teams may be as educated in capable of helping develop a plan as you are. And there is a lot of good information that's generated from those knowledgeable volunteers that come together in a planning meeting to help talk about the dates for service learning projects, mowing, digging of holes, what flower species we're going to produce, what state and federal grant funds we've got that enable us to leverage our time. So planning meetings are essential both to help us work together as a team, but it also helps to have volunteers buy in that they are actually part of the team because they are an equal and meaningful part of the team. Generally our approach is a seasonal approach. The volunteer efforts are driven by what we can do season to season. Our volunteer team is largely composed of, of uh, retired aged people. And as a result, it's very difficult for us to conduct growing season burns. Growing season means summer burns, and it's hot here in the summer, and it's a real safety issue to put people on a fire line in the Houston area in July and August when you might be doing a growing season burn. Not something that we can risk from a safety perspective, and our burn seasons are always in the winter, January and February. Our winter season also focuses significantly on propagating seeds in our greenhouse. We collect seeds in the fall, we begin to put them in our seed trays in the greenhouse and uh, monitor and water them through the winter. As the spring approaches, as I mentioned, we do vegetation monitoring. monitoring. We have more school groups, high school and college groups coming out. And we also like to have a big party called the Black Stem Rendezvous, bringing everybody together. I'll talk to you about that a little bit more. June through September is when prairies are hard and dry in the Houston area, and that's when that heavy equipment 
is available to be put out into the prairie without it getting stuck. So we do a lot of mowing in the prairie in the summer. We also do a significant amount of herbicide treatment. As the fall approaches, the seasonal aspect returns back to planning, looking ahead to what we're going to do. Our big annual event is always on the third Saturday of every October, and we continue doing vegetation monitoring and service learning. Next month, we'll be gearing up for burn season. We do a burn training class the first Saturday of every December. We try to solicit, recruit, and train new burn team volunteers at that class. It's a required class to be part of the burn team. And we continue with prairie plant propagation. So you've heard the whole approach here. You might have noticed that there are different categories of volunteers that these different activities can fall into, regularly scheduled volunteer activities. I'm convinced that the success of Stewardship Saturday and Prairie Friday is that regularity. It is the fact that there's no committal and it is the fact that if you decide you want to be on the stewardship email list, then you'll know what's coming, and you can come or not come as you see fit. That regularly scheduled community-based event of Prairie Pandemonium is also regularly scheduled on the third Saturday of every October. The seasonal events we just ran through, prairie mowing, vegetation monitoring, burn season in the wintertime, planning meetings, and our big annual party. Increasingly, we're working with local corporations, particularly from the Pasadena Industrial District. We are finding that increasingly corporations are giving less money and more work to nonprofit organizations. And occasionally, they're willing to donate money to have their people come to do something. So we are working increasingly with those larger industrial neighbors of ours to come and help do different projects to benefit the Prairie and the Nature Center as a whole. So this has been going on for about 20 years at the Nature Center now. We've learned a few things along the way. I would say that one of the big lessons learned for me has been to start small. Make sure that when you start small that you put the people in your team first. And it's interesting in prairies because putting people first is also putting prairies first because prairies are people dependent. And if you can't have your people become dedicated and committed, not likely that they're going to stay around. That's the importance of creating a friendly environment, creating a soil where the people can actually bloom in the prairie. I work with people that have put astronauts on the moon as some of my volunteers. I work with people that have been plant managers at local industries. Those people have good ideas and uh, sometimes volunteers aren't interested in taking no for an answer. That's the term we use for collaborative leadership. <laughs> collaborative leadership really means there are a lot of people with a lot of good ideas and uh, you have to have some flexibility when you're working with other in intelligent, dedicated people. Some of those dedicated people that I just mentioned to you actually take their vacation days to come do service learning projects at the Nature Center. Uh, and it's because of that that it's important to give thanks to volunteers. People are giving of their time freely to support the place that I love and I care about. And giving thanks means every time you see those people, and it can also mean giving thanks in an annual way through a big celebration. We have a, a black stem and a blue stem rendezvous, which is at the end of the burn season and at the end of the planting season, which brings all of those various tribes together onto our prairie platform where we can look out over where the deer and the antelope play, although not that many antelope probably. But uh, this big viewing platform allows volunteers to look over the fruits of their labor over the entire year. We share uh, food and beverages and friendship. And if you're really fortunate, you might have a chance to listen to the Bayou Filiacs do a bluegrass hayride through the prairie. So by now, I know that many of you are wondering, what can I do to get involved with this type of operation? And many of you may be wondering, do I really have what it takes? And the answer is yes. I can tell you as the Supreme Commander of the Prairie Liberation Army, when I look out over this audience, what I see is new recruits. And for you, those of you that are growing your volunteer operations, 
Everywhere you go, you should be bringing your clipboards to try to recruit new volunteers. And it turns out today, I'm doing that with you. <laughs> and the next best opportunity for you is our prescribed burn training class, which is on December the 5th. You can sign up and get your name on that email list if you'd like to become part of our burn team. I mentioned to you this is our annual training for the burn team at the Nature Center. You can also become part of the Alpha Elite Strike Team Force of the Prairie Liberation Army, which is the Prairie Friday team. It so happens I have a clipboard here for you today. Also, if you'd like to sign up for that, you thought I was kidding when I said that you should always be in recruiting mode, and now you know otherwise. Questions? I hope that as prairie enthusiasts, you're trying to spread as much good prairie propaganda around the world as you can. I've brought some prairie propaganda for you today. If you'd like to pick up some of our prairie ecology and restoration pamphlets, please stop by and uh, pick these up as you're signing up for one of these classes. How difficult was it for you to get your burn permit to Pasadena? Or is this something that's ongoing still? Or? We've maintained a burn permit since 1979. So uh, that was long ago, and there was a lot of resistance. Uh, particularly Harris County Pollution Control came, and they actually took air samples during that first burn to determine what type of particulate matter what type of impacts we were going to have on our neighbors. The good thing for us is that we are immediately adjacent to the Pasadena Industrial District in the Houston Ship Channel. So, I mean, it'd be really kind of hard for pollution control to point at us and not acknowledge a lot of the emissions that were happening across the street. So are you close to any major roads when you do your Yeah, you bet we are. And smoke management is as important as fire management. And when you're on a, a high-speed roadway, if you release dense smoke onto a high-speed, you know, traffic scene, you're responsible if somebody gets killed. That means you've got to have high confidence in the weather prediction that's going to have a wind direction that carries the smoke away from the road, which is why that's always defined as a critical element of a prescribed burn is only under specific weather conditions. Oh, don't say get away with it. <laughs> say we've done such an excellent sure job through the years. Mm. Golly gee, one question? I, I've got okay. A question. Okay. I, I was really impressed with the long term history of your burning uh, efforts, and you've had four specific wildfire events. That's good. Yeah, you can bring that up. I'll and, talk about that. And What do you mean differences? differences? I'm not sure. Is there any impact on the vegetation? What uh, timing of the year? Were they, uh, were they at different times of the year than the normal burning season? All of those wildfires were ignited by humans. None of them were lightning strikes. I don't know if that's what you're in inferring that no, you think. No, yeah. I'm looking at even most, most fires being human or, or originated like that, but many times they happen in the summer and get drastically different results in the vegetation than There's only one summer fire that has happened. Uh, the first fire happened before I started work there in 1975. But the other summer fire that took place was a, was a muffler ignition of a tractor that was mowing prairie at the time. And uh, I, I didn't really notice significant changes, but you know what we do know from, from research is there is a lot of higher mortality to woody species in summer burns because typically summer soils are much drier and woody vegetation is already stressed because of those low soil moistures and their recovery after a growing season burn is a, a lot less. 
Uh, I can't say that I observed or documented that from the muffler fire or not, though. Yes, sir. Uh, relative to planting materials, do you, do you, are there any prairie units, do you plant all across the prairie, or are there any prairie units that were in good enough shape to start with that were pretty much loaded with native flora that does not need to be augmented? There are just a few, few patches that are uh, dominated by little blue stem that we have done very little work in, but largely most of the, the this side of Galveston Bay was heavily grazed for a century, and Armand Bayou's area was no exception to that. Big changes, most of the dominant grasses had disappeared, uh, very little uh, wildflower or forb diversity, so that's largely what we focus on. Lead by example. Please lead by example. That, that's right. Ten minutes before the next talk, so come on up and get some.